Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so in this paper, I focus on one particular feature of urban form that as economists we tend to ignore, and that's the spatial layout of cities, the geometry of urban footprints. In fields such as um, urban planning or transportation engineering, city shape is thought to be an important determinant of intra-urban commuting efficiency along with factors such as infrastructure, travel demand, land use, and many more. And there's a simple geometry-based argument behind this, which is that a circle is a shape that minimizes distances between points, but as the shape of a polygon holding area constant departs from that of a circle, becoming less and less compact, distances between points will tend to increase. And similarly, cities could start out being roughly circular, but as they expand in space over time, they could hit some topographic constraint that prevents them from growing in some of the possible directions, or maybe one side of the city ends up expanding faster due to regulation or some kind of deliberate planning choice. So in the end, real-world cities have different shapes, and all else being equal, cities that have more compact geometries will be characterized by shorter potential within city trips. And let me start by giving you a quick illustration of this idea. These are Kolkata and Bangalore, rescaled so that they have the same area. And you can probably tell from this picture that Kolkata is less compact uh, than Bangalore, but what does this imply in terms of potential commuting distances? The average within city trip in these two polygons, proxied by the average distance between any two points, is about 20 kilometers in Kolkata. It would be only 14 kilometers if Kolkata holding area constant had the more compact shape that Bangalore has. So in this paper, I'm trying to investigate empirically the economic implications of city shape in the context of India. And I'll be interpreting shape primarily as a shifter of potential commuting distances. Um, I am also um, exploiting plausibly exogenous variation in city shape due to topographic obstacles within a revealed preference Rosen-Robach framework to assess the welfare loss from deteriorating urban shape, by which I mean, again, an urban layout conducive to longer potential trips. Now, why am I doing this in India? For various reasons. It's a rapidly urbanizing economy, so we have a chance to really see some variation in the shapes of cities as they expand. We have a large panel of cities of meaningful size. And it's also a context in which issues related to urban form are perceived as very policy relevant as of today. And on the one hand, uh, the policy debate has focused on the perceived harms of rapid urban growth in terms of sprawl and increasingly long commutes. But on the other hand, there is also a concern that some specific regulatory tools currently in place in Indian <coughs> cities might be contributing to distorting urban form. And the most paradigmatic example is probably restrictions on building height. So my main question relates to how consumers and firms are affected by urban compactness when making location choices across cities. Do they value compact city shape? I investigate this question drawing upon a simple version of the rosen robeck model, classic model of spatial equilibrium across cities. Um, guided by the predictions of this model, I will start by looking at the impact of city shape on population, wages, and housing rents. Now, if we do find that city shape matters, the next question is what can we do about it, given that not all cities can be circular. Um, first, I will look at an example of a private response to city shape, the location choices of firms within cities. Um, and second, I will look at policy. On the one hand, there are policy tools to counteract the negative impact of poor urban geometry, and that's um, the case for investments in road infrastructure. Um, but on the other hand, uh, policy, and in particular land use regulations, also interact with topographic obstacles in determining the shape that a city grows into. Um, in terms of methodology, I assemble a panel that covers roughly 460 cities in India. I track um, the dynamic evolution of their shapes over time by combining historic maps with satellite imagery. For each city year, I will compute a number of indicators of shape that are based on distances uh, between points. Uh, now, 
One challenge is that um, in estimating these relationships between city shape and city year level outcomes is that urban shape is an equilibrium outcome. It depends on topography which is given but also on deliberate um, choices. So to overcome this endogeneity of city shape, I propose an instrumental variables approach. I construct an instrument uh, for city shape that varies at the city year level and is based on combining topographic obstacles with a mechanical model for how cities expand in space over time. In a nutshell, the idea is to instrument the actual shape that a city has at a given point in time with the potential shape that it can have given the topographic obstacles that surround it. And this instrument, as you will see once I describe it in detail, has time variation to account for the fact that as cities expand in space over time, they will hit different sets of topographic obstacles that affect the city's shape differently at different stages of its growth. So the main result is that compact shape is essentially like a consumption amenity. I find that when cities grow into better shapes, population increases, wages decrease, and housing rents increase. So in a spatial equilibrium framework, the interpretation is that households are basically paying um, through a combination of higher rents and foregone wages in order to live in cities that are more compact. And the, the premium that they pay is actually found to be quite large. For a one standard deviation deterioration in shape, the welfare loss is estimated to be equivalent to a 5% um, decrease in income. And interestingly, I don't find that compact, that compact shape is affecting the productivity of firms. The, cost, the costs of bad shape appear to be borne entirely by consumers. Um, this could be related to the location choices of firms within cities. When I explore the relationship between city shape and the degree of polycentricity, I find that non-compact cities are not more polycentric. If anything, they're less polycentric. And we, can, we will talk more about this once we get to the results. Um, I also find some indication that um, the, what consumers dislike about non-compact cities has to do with commuting. I find that better road infrastructure and availability of motor vehicles reduces the negative impacts of poor geometry. And finally, looking at policy responses to uh, bad city shape, I focus on land use regulations and more specifically floor area ratios. Um, that is to say, restrictions on building height. Um, I find that cities that have more restrictive FARs end up having footprints that are both larger in terms of surface area, but also less compact relative to what their topography and predicted population growth would suggest. So this is the outline for the rest of the talk. To frame my empirical question of how consumers and firms are affected by uh, city shape in making their location choices, I draw upon, as I mentioned, uh, I draw upon the rosen roebuck model, a very um, standard and well-known framework to think about spatial equilibrium across cities. This is a model in which consumers and firms in equilibrium are indifferent across cities that have different levels of consumption and production amenities. Wages and rents are essentially striking a balance between the location preferences of consumers and firms. One of the reduced form predictions is that cities that have better consumption amenities should have larger populations, lower wages, and higher housing rents. And the exercise here will be to establish whether compact shape is a consumption amenity, a production amenity, or both. So let me just very quickly sketch the model just to remind us how population wages and rents are related to amenities in equilibrium. Consumers are optimally choosing uh, in which city to locate. Their utility depends on consumption, um, on um, they consume a composite good C and housing H. Their utility essentially depends on labor income, net of housing costs, and on a city-specific um, consumption amenities parameter theta. Uh, the, their optimization problem yields um, this condition, which tells us that in equilibrium, indirect utility V bar is equalized across cities and gives us a key intuition that in equilibrium, households pay for better amenities theta uh, through a combination of um, lower wages and higher housing rents. Um, and in particular, the extent to which um, housing costs net of wages increase with an amenity gives us a measure of the extent to which that amenity is improving utility. To close the model, we also need to specify firms in the production sector and land developers in the construction sector. Both operate optimally. 
firms um, are also choosing in which city to locate production. Their technology requires labor, which moves freely across cities and, um, and capital. And there's a city-specific productivity parameter A, that's production amenities. Firms' profits are equalized across cities. Land developers produce housing using land and building height. And again, construction profits are also equalized. So using the three optimality conditions from the, pro the optimization problem of respectively consumers, firms, and land developers, we can solve the model for the three key endogenous variables, population, wages, and rents, as functions of production and consumption amenities. <coughs> so what are the reduced form predictions? Um, Assume that, suppose that compact city shape is a pure consumption amenity. It increases the utility of consumers, but doesn't otherwise affect, that doesn't uh, affect firms directly through A. Then the reduced form prediction is that more compact cities should have in equilibrium larger populations, lower wages, and higher rents. Suppose instead that compact city, city shape is also a production amenity on top of being a consumption amenity, then the reduced form predictions are similar except that the impact on wages is now ambiguous. It depends on who values compact shape the most, whether consumers or firms. So let's take these predictions to the data. First, let me tell you about my data sources. I, um, I retrieve boundaries of urban areas uh, from two sources. The first is a series of topographic maps of India produced in 1950 by the U.S. Army. I georeferenced them and uh, manually traced the perimeter of urban areas. And next, for every year between 1992 and uh, 2010, I use satellite imagery of nighttime lights. Um, essentially, cities appear in this type of imagery as contiguous patches of saturated light. So what I do is essentially set some luminosity threshold and then consider as urban, spatially contiguous lighted areas around the coordinates of each city with luminosity above that threshold. Uh, and the threshold can, uh, can also be varied for robustness. In general, this um, procedure will tend to give you uh, quite broad definitions of urban areas that go beyond the official um, census definition or municipal boundaries. Um, and next, I, I code geographic constraints to city expansion, combining two high-resolution sources on elevation and uh, presence of water bodies. I classify a land pixel as constrained if it has slope above 15% or if it corresponds to a water body. <coughs> Sorry. In terms of outcome data, these are my main sources. Um, Data explicitly at the city level is hard to find for India. The census from which I take population is basically the only source. For wages and rents, I'm uh, relying on district urban averages that I'm using as proxies for city level averages. Wages are from the annual survey of industries, and an important caveat to keep in mind is that these are formal sector manufacturing wages. For rents, I use information from the National Sample Survey. Households are asked how much they pay in rent, and there's an imputed figure for uh, owners. Um, how do I quantify city geometry? Um, I, I compute a series of shape metrics that are borrowed from the urban planning and landscape ecology literature. Um, these are all um, based on distances between points in a polygon. They all have interpretations in terms of uh, potential trip patterns. My benchmark indicator is what I call disconnection. It's the average distance between any two points in a shape. So it's a very, you can view it as a very general proxy for the average within city trip. Um, one more point on this, all of these metrics are mechanically correlated with footprint size. A larger city will have longer trips mechanically, so the approach to deal with this is either to explicitly control for city area or to normalize these measures by uh, footprint radius, and I will, I will follow both approaches in my empirics. Now, so the goal, as I mentioned, is that of estimating the impact of shape on a number of city year-level outcomes, primarily population wages and rents. Shape is an endogenous outcome. Um, the bias, if we were to estimate this naively by OLS, could play out in different ways. Um, to, let's think of population as a dependent variable. It could be that faster growing cities uh, have better urban planning practices, um, which would result in uh, more compact cities having larger populations in equilibrium. It could go in the opposite direction if we think that faster growing cities are <coughs> cities that expand in a less planned, more chaotic fashion. 
So to overcome this endogeneity problem, I propose the following instrument. So I'm going to describe first in words how the instrument is constructed and then show you how it works um, in a map. So the idea is to take the largest contiguous portion of unconstrained land, by which I mean land that is, that is developable, um, within a given radius around each city. And I call this the potential footprint. And then I'll be using the shape properties of the potential footprint as instruments for the shape properties of the actual city footprint. And to give time variation to this instrument, I will be considering time va varying radii around the city's historic footprint to incorporate the idea that as cities expand, they hit new sets of constraints. So the first step is to classify the land area as constrained or developable. And um, the first year in the panel is 1950. This is Mumbai's footprint in 1950. I take the minimum bounding circle of this footprint. Within this radius, I take the largest contiguous portion of unconstrained land. This green polygon is what I call the potential footprint. And I'll be using the shape properties of this green polygon as instruments for the shape properties computed for the actual city footprint. And what I'm going to do next for the, for the following years in the panel is considering larger concentric disks around this historic footprint. So this will be the potential footprint in 1992. This will be the potential footprint in 2000. And to complete the description of the instrument, I still need to tell you how these R hats are determined. How do these radii expand? Um, essentially, they expand uh, by postulating a mechanical model for how cities expand in space. In the simplest and preferred version of this model, these radii expand all at the same rate for all cities, and this rate of expansion is equal to the average computed throughout the panel. In other words, I use this purely mechanical common rate model to predict the area that a city should occupy in a given year, and then I take the radius of a circle with area equivalent to that. And I'll, I'm also considering an alternative version of this model where the, the rate of expansion is city-specific and depends on projected city-specific historic um, population. So going back to the map, just two points I want to emphasize on the identification. This is all conditional on city and year fixed effects. So I'm basically exploiting changes in shape that the same city undergoes over time. And these are changes driven by topography interacted with mechanically predicted city growth. And the second point is that I'm exploiting a very specific feature of geography. Um, the instrument is not, not based on the generic presence of something like the coast or a mountain. What matters is really where individual uh, constraints are positioned in space relative to one another and whether this allows for more or less compact development. And this mitigates the concern that with my instrument I might be picking up some direct amenity or disamenity value of geography. Um, and finally, one more thing. Uh, for illustrative purposes, I'm showing you an example with a city that is extremely constrained, but the predictive power of the instrument is not limited to cities with such extreme topographies. In one of my robustness checks, I will drop coastal and mountainous cities, and results are actually um, very close. Um, so the first specification that I consider is an empirical counterpart of the model's prediction. I will be looking at the impact of shape S on um, a, a number of outcomes Y to fix ideas, think of population, conditional on city area. Um, and I will be using two instruments. So there are two endogenous regressors here, shape and area. I already discussed my instrument for shape. And I will be instrumenting city area using projected historic population. Now, we might worry that projected historic population is, is correlated with current outcomes. So my preferred specification is one that doesn't rely on this and that doesn't explicitly control for city area. So for an outcome such as population, the most natural way to do this is to normalize both right and left-hand side by city area. So I'll be looking at population density uh, regressed on a normalized version of my shape <coughs> indicator. So now let me get to results. Um, first, um, the first stage. The first column is the first stage for the single instrument specification, normalized shape explained by normalized potential shape. Columns two and three are the two first stages for city shape and area separately instrumented for. Potential shape is a strong predictor of actual shape, and projected historic population predicts um, city area. 
Now let's look at outcomes to start with population. Um, the first two columns report the IV um, estimates for the single instrument and double instrument specification, and the third column is the OLS reported as a reference. As cities, gr so let me quickly remind you, uh, shape here means the disconnection index. It's the average, it's the length of the average within city trips. So higher values imply longer trips and less compact shapes. Um, as cities grow into worse shapes, population density goes down and population goes down conditional on city area. Um, in the OLS, um, it is interesting to note that the sign flips. So in the OLS, we have that uh, less compact cities grow faster. Um, and that comes from the fact that cities have a natural tendency to deteriorate in shape. Once they are founded, they are placed in a relatively favorable location. But as they expand, inevitably, they will hit constraints at some point. Um, I will skip the robustness checks. Um, let's look at wages and rents. Um, as cities grow into worse shapes, wages increase. That's true both in the OLS and in the IV. Um, and let me remind you, these are average, uh, these are district level averages of um, formal sector wages. Rents, um, results are noisier here. It's only a very small sample of three consecutive years. There, there is only a handful of NSS waves for which the, the data is, is available at the urban district level. But um, the pattern seems to be that as cities grow into less compact shapes, rents decrease in the IV and it's a pretty much a zero relationship in the OLS. So um, again, I'm going to skip on this. What I'm going to do next is use these reduced form estimates in conjunction with the model to understand whether city shape is... So the, the, res, the reduced form estimates show us that city shape is primarily a consumption amenity, but what I'm going to do next is use them in the model, with, in conjunction with the model, to understand if it's also production amenity and what the welfare loss is from um, deteriorating shape. So um, I take the first or the, the optimization condition from the consumer's problem, take derivatives with respect to shape S, and this allows us to back out the impact of a one unit increase in indicator S in shape on utility as the difference between the estimated impact on um, housing rents times the share of housing in consumption alpha and the impact on, on wages. So using my most conservative, re conservative reduced form estimates and calibrating alpha from the NSS um, data, I find that for a one standard deviation increase in disconnection, which for the average sized city in my panel implies that your average potential round trip increases by 720 meters, the welfare loss is equivalent to a 5% income decrease. And just to give you a sense of the magnitudes, the, to cover the, uh, an additional 720 meters would take about 2.3% of your working day. Um, I can do a similar exercises for firms to back out the implied productivity impact of, um, of shape. Um, this is the profit maximization condition. Again, we can take derivatives with respect to shape to back out the implied impact of shape on uh, the city-specific productivity parameter A. Um, what I find is that there is a very small negligible um, decrease in productivity as uh, city shape deteriorates. So the, the cost of that shape is borne entirely by consumers. It looks like firms are able to optimize against bad shape in ways that consumers cannot. And my next set of results might suggest that this has to do with where firms locate in cities. So I have, so unfortunately I don't have information on where people live within cities, but I do have some information on where firms are. So I'm going to use this uh, single cross-section of firms' addresses to look at the spatial distribution of employment. Um, I use a non-parametric procedure to identify the number of employment sub-centers in each city. And then I look at how shape um, affects this number. And interestingly, I find that um, larger cities, in terms of surface area, do have more employment subcenters, but conditional in city area, uh, less compact cities are not more polycentric. So it looks like in equilibrium, firms prefer to locate in relatively few um, subcenters. They're happy to compensate their employees for the longer trips that they might potentially face, and, and they just pay them higher wages for that. Um, very quickly, I inter by interacting shape with proxies for infrastructure, I find that um, the availability of road density, but also the um, availability, sorry, the um, a a higher road density, but also the availability of motor vehicles, 
uh, reduces the negative impact of disconnected shape on population density. This substantiates the interpretation that shape mad might matter uh, through some urban transit channel. And finally, I do want to talk a little bit about my results on land use regulations and city shape. So I have some information on floor area ratios in a cross-section of Indian cities as of year 2000. So um, floor area ratios are the subject of a major debate in India right now. These are vertical limits expressed as the maximum allowed ratio of um, the total floor area of the building on the area um, of the plot on which the building sits. And FARs are considered exceptionally low uh, in Indian cities relative to international standards. So what I want to do is um, understand how FARs interact with topography in explaining city shape. And here I'm showing you the three first stages for shape, for normalized shape, shape and area augmented with interactions between each of my instruments and FARs. And what I find is that cities that have more permissive, higher FARs, uh, and can therefore grow vertically, um, have better shapes relative to what their topography would suggest, but also relative to what the projected historic population growth would predict. So it seems that more permissive FARs can slow down the deterioration in shape that fast population growth um, entails. They also, these cities with more permissive FARs also end up having smaller footprints in terms of surface area. So to conclude, um, these results suggest that poor urban connectivity as driven by non-compact city shape uh, entails welfare losses and can affect the spatial equilibrium across cities. Um, and one final point I want to make is that even though in my work I focus on topography to gain identification, and topography is obviously given, it's not a policy variable, to the extent that these results more generally speak um, about the importance of intra-urban connectivity, there is, there is actually a wide range of possible policy responses, both to tackle intra-urban mobility directly through investments in road infrastructure, for example, uh, but also indirectly by promoting more compact um, development, which is something that can be achieved through uh, land use regulations that encourage land consolidation or promote vertical growth. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have Melanie Morton as a discussion.